payphone era, we back. So, being that you were spitting for um, Jam Master J of Run DMC, you know, arguably one of the best groups in hip hop ever, did you have any plans or any dreams as far as him signing you or putting you on, or was his co-sign just enough to make you wanna keep writing and keep being an MC? Nah, no, I mean, I kept writing. I kept writing and uh, I ended up getting into it with one of the cats. I can't even forget his name. He shall remain nameless anyway, even if I know his name. We got into it and I was gonna body his ass. So <laughs> I left, I started hustling. You know what I mean? I can't even name the cast that used to be on 109 and got brew at the time. They was actually the first cats I bought my first weight from before I went out of town with. But mind you, I used to go to East New York Vocational, but I moved to Jamaica, Queens, Southside Jamaica, Queens, and I transferred to Jamaica in my 10th grade year. Okay, East New York was a, a vocational school. East New York, Brooklyn? East New York, the school, East New York Vocational, AKA Transit Tech, was a vocational school located in East New York, Brooklyn. I moved to Southside Jamaica, Queens. That ninth grade year, I was failing all my classes because that commute was ridiculous. So I transferred to Jamaica. Jamaica High School, I used to get out of school at 1230 because they didn't have no vocational classes. All I had was math, social study, English, and lunch. Well, we had science too, of course, but those were my only classes. I only had five classes. So what that made me be able to do, that made me be able to go out on the block and hustle from 1230 to four before niggas got out of school. That's when niggas was getting 35 off 100 too on 109 America. Shout out to whoever was doing that. I can't throw y'all out there. But y'all know who y'all are. So what was the what did the, um, the commute consist of in the morning? Like with uh, the train, train uh, uh, bus, bus to the bus to the train, to the train, and then train to the train to the bus to the bus to get back home. To get back home. By how long did that take you? Roughly? It was two hours. Each way. Each way. Killing. So would you say that was one of your? you know, problems with school? Is Was it the commute or was it the work or were you bored or it was just the commute that was? Yeah. I, my IQ 160, I never had a problem with school. You heard? So you actually liked the school, it was just the commute that right. made it tough. Right. Still to this day, you see me watching videos of dudes forging knives and all that because that's what I went to school for. But the truth is I wanted to be an electrician. You did? What did you learn about um, forging knives and things like that? At school, ninth, ninth grade year, freshman year in high school. The first thing we ever made was a can opener out of a, a, a six inch piece of metal. You did? Okay. That was the first thing I ever made. I mean, but you know, I start fucking with a chick. He was Eddie Murphy's niece. It's a picture of me with a hair bone and Timberlands, a family picture. She brought me all that. I mean, Eddie she Murphy shall Murphy. remain nameless. Yes, and Eddie Murphy called my crib. It was talking to my moms. My moms wanted him to do the laugh, and he was like, that was a fake laugh. You had to pay him some serious bread for him to get that laugh. So she never got the laugh, but yeah. But she never liked her, and she turned out being not good for me. She start messing with some cats off the football team, so. Okay, so how did your musical interest as far as you writing and things um, progress after you left school, after school is over? Now you're a young adult, your early 20s. How did okay. it progress? I'm on 109 and Merit with the guys I told you that ran that block, that territory, and Black Doom, Peanut and Danielle, they were the guys. They were a rap group. You understand what I'm saying? They they ran it. So, in my opinion, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be better than them. You understand what I'm saying? I wanted to be better than them. And they were the guys. Like, Mr. Cheeks used to come through the hood and holler at Doom. 
You feel me? Like, like, like they was checking for doom. So that's where I was going. It's funny you mentioned Mr. Cheeks. I was going to ask you, besides Run DMC and Onyx, you know, being in Queens mm -hmm. during that era, did you bump into any other rappers? Oh, yeah. Fight Dog used to be in uh, uh, St. Albans Park. Almost any good day you could catch Fight Dog in St. Albans Park. That's Fight Dog of a Tribe Five Called Fight Dog Quest. from a Tribe Called Quest. Mind you. It's a Linden Boulevard in Brooklyn and it's a Linden Boulevard in Queens. So when you hear a tribe called Quest Round and Saint uh, back in the days of the Boulevard of Linden, they're talking about Linden Boulevard in Queens. But I'm from East New York and I lived at 3 Louisiana Avenue between Hageman and New Lots. But what's the other block right there, right, right diagonally from, from Hageman? Is Linden Boulevard. That's interesting, ain't it? But I mean, if you know, you know. So, yeah. That's what it was. Like, I ran into Fight Dog a few times. I never rapped for him. You know, I was still on my, my little timid shit. But I was running around getting a little bit of money. So, you know, I still wrote, though. I, 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 I always wrote. I always wrote. And, you know, after the Jam Master J situation and all that went down, you know, like, you got to understand, I was the oldest in my crib. All my brothers had went off on their own and was already doing their thing. It's ironic that after I lost my job, my brother ended up coming home like, yo, you, you know, you need something. And I'm like, yo, I'm out here doing this, that, and the third. I used to shortstop on 167 and 110 because everybody that hustled had to close down when the stores closed. So where were you at when um, Jam Master J was murdered? I was here. In West Virginia? Yeah, I was here. I was how, how did that make you feel? I mean, rappers get killed that we like and die for different reasons over the time. You know, over the years, a lot of them, you know, hey, that spread the God. It affected me greatly. I mean, I ain't cried like I cried when Biggie died, but you know, it hurt though, you know what I mean? It, it really hurt. Like I said, I never was looking for JMJ or to put me on as a label and all that because I used to hear all the horror stories, you know what I mean? From Fred and Sticky, I followed their career. I still got the black and white glossy that they gave me. <laughs> they say to Sean the Buck Wild Shorty from the desert. <laughs> if you know what the desert is, then you know I'm not lying. So why did you cry when Biggie died versus when JMJ? Bro, how did he that make deserve you feel? It. He ain't deserve it. He ain't deserve it. He did not. Like, dude tell you, yo, don't run with these dudes. You still want to run with them. Something happened to you. You blame him. You find out the truth. You still want some industry shit. You want to sell records, so you just let it go on and on and on and on. Niggas killed Big because he was the hottest motherfucker at the time. Bar none. True. And they man, and they man was gone. I mean, he ain't had nothing to do with that. You know what I mean? When he says that man, he was referring to Tupac. Definitely, I'm talking about Pac. But shout out to Pac, too. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Pac too. You know, I'm a huge Me Against the World fan. Me Against the World, that's my motto. I live Me Against the World. Meaning Me Against the World, not the actual songs, but the concept and what it stood for. I understood what he was going through. So would it be safe to say you think that was uh, Tupac Shakur's best album, in your opinion? Me Against the World? No, sir. Where you go with? I pick Machiavelli. I think Machiavelli was. I like was Illuminati his. to Don. Yeah, Illuminati. Yep, that's the I one. I like Illuminati to Don. And Living Dying in L.A. was my joint. I actually see. I was on some. I ain't fucking with Pac shit. And then he dropped Living and Dying in L.A. and I was like, Yeah, I'm fucking with Son again because he ain't dissing no more. He just getting back to the music like he was supposed to because. You couldn't fuck with him when he was just in his regular element. I ain't really, 
he didn't need to diss nobody like, like straight to their face or none of that, but that was him. He didn't need to, though. True. Man, what's the joint off of me against the world? We, tonight's the night I get in some shit. When he used all the peas. Man, he went crazy on that joint. That might be his best verse. Like, I mean, just like lyrics, beats, and rhymes, that might be his best verse. I'm sure other people gonna say, nah, when he said this about such and such was his best verse, or when he said this about such and such, that was his best verse. No. Lyrics for lyric, word for word, he was rhyming like some New York shit and he topped every New York nigga at the time. And shout out to Easy Mo B because you was lacing that nigga. Gave him everything he needed on that. But we know how that turned out. They relationship end up on some fuck shit too, but you know, yeah. grown men gonna be grown men. So would you crying when Biggie passed and having a liking or liking Pac, how did you feel when they went through their conflict? I'm not going to call it the East-West conflict. Can I put a disclaimer on that? Yes, I'm not going to call it the East-West conflict. Can I put a disclaimer on that? The disclaimer is this. How long Biggie been dead? What, 97, right? When was my son born? I don't know. Mine was 2000, the first one. (laughs) When was my son born? Biggie died on my lady's birthday. We was at the fucking Red Roof Inn in South Charleston. That was when the white E and J first came out. Mm. I was making my nigga shame. And that shit came on the news and she woke me up. You hear me? Yeah, and the, and the media wasn't all that back then. They were it wasn't slow no to fucking think. media. It yeah. was on the news. Yeah. Like, right when it happened on some CNN shit, because I always watch the news, you know. And she woke me up. I cried. I called my man. Shout out to Jaga. I called him. He was crying, too. Don't ever let him tell you he wasn't. That was the Brooklyn savior. So when he say we did it, Brooklyn, like, we all felt like we did it. You don't understand but anyway, back to what you was asking me. Go ahead, because I don't remember. I just had to throw that in there. Me and my lady, we were celebrating you, her with, birthday. With you having a liking for Pac, but crying when Biggie passed away. So it's obvious you wasn't biased towards Biggie. I, I was mad that Pac died, too. I was mad when Pac died. How could I not be? That was a major blow to hip-hop. And, I, and, and, and I'll prove it to you. Name five good records that came out after Pac died. Pac died in September of what, 96? Yeah, 96. Okay, ain't shit come out in 96 at the end of that. But what, Jay-Z's first album? Second album? Did Nas have something? Wasn't he should have been on right? Nas came out at the beginning of the year. Okay. Oh yeah, you talking? Okay. Yeah. Nas came out at the beginning of '96 with the I Am, his second album, which it they bootlegged. That's arguably one of the best Nas joints, but they bootlegged to fuck up his momentum. So, with you being an artist, an MC, an artist, are there any other rappers or singers that passed away where it affected you, like they like um, Biggie or Tupac? I mean. Death is death, man. All deaths affect me one way or another. You feel me? Did it affect you any way musically? Like, I want to write harder. I don't want to write no more or uh, anything like that. Nothing affects my writing except for what's going on with me. You know what I mean? I I, I got tons. I got tons of shit. I got shit. I got pages of shit that probably only got one word. I got pages of shit that only got one sentence. I got so much shit, it's just, uh, the music for me is all about emotion, man. You gotta be able to capture that emotion and transport that emotion. So it goes from here to here to here, then to a record or to a beat, and then to here, to the consumer. And that's how I do it. For me, like, the first part is capturing your air. But I might capture your heart, your mind, or your soul by saying something. Especially if you can relate. If you can relate, then you like, yeah, he caught that. 
But if you can't, ah, you might skip through to the next song. So here's a tough question. You could take a second to think about the answer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what separates you, the world famous Plenty, mm -hmm. from any other artist? I don't know, somebody in the middle of Idaho or somebody in South Carolina. What, what makes you any different? Why should anybody listen to you? I wouldn't know a major separation, but what I will tell you is what I've always you. been honest. I so always I told the you truth. Yeah, man. I don't... I'm not... So you're not into gimmicks to sell records no, or sir. bring attention to no, yourself? No, sir. And that's probably why I haven't made it yet. That's probably why I haven't made it yet. I gotta stay true to me and my guys and do what I do, you know? Like, true. Like I said, it's a state of mind. It's all about capturing emotion. And lately, though, I'm like, damn, I'm selling poison. I don't want to corrupt no more people. Musically. Nah, yo, in real life. In real life. It was a time where people was like, doing shit just to rap about it. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Nah, I said it best. So you're the type to shoot a leg to get your name known. Right. True. Well, I was already getting to it and I never put that in none of my music. So I tell you the truth, but you know, it was, it was sprinkle. I sprinkle or I, put a dab of this here or a dab of that there. So if you was in the know, you knew what I was talking about, but I wasn't never incriminating myself ever. So do you feel for people who have been through things that, you know, might not have been so legal or favorable towards, you know, quote unquote society, do you feel they're wrong for including that in their music or do you think they're wrong for glorifying that or do you think it's justified because it could be considered you know self snitching or self incrimination so how, how do you feel about that about people who put those things okay so this is the deal because that's a big deal nowadays they okay, do this something is the deal. They for me them. I would never do those things now now what the next person eat don't make me shit but how does it make you feel? Yeah, uh, I you? don't. I don't agree. I don't agree because I done seen people get jammed up for doing the song, telling on themselves. True. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like, if it's gonna lead to that, then don't do it, kids. If it's gonna lead to you going to jail, don't do it. Don't do it. So you're basically saying rely more on the talent to create music versus relying on your past or what you're doing in the streets. That's or. the talent right there. Because you take that reality and you broadcast it without incriminating yourself. That takes talent. True. Now, 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 hold on though. Let me, let me, let me, let me spin the block for you real quick. I do believe that they more talented than me, more talented than me when they can make up shit like that. Make I'm just up going lies. From memory. I'm just going for memory. You dig? I'm yeah. going for memory and I put a twist on it so I won't get locked up for it. But shout out to the guy that's making it all up. Shout out to you, brother. Whoever's making all that shit up and never did it, you are very, very creative, and I salute you guys. But remember, I only listen to certain shit one time. And they could have millions of streams. So you realize that it is easier, you know, people would rather believe a big lie than a small truth. That's what, that's what the society we in. So even with music, people would rather believe big lies than the small truth versus a dude saying, yo, I got bad credit and I'm broke and somebody owe me $10,000 versus saying, oh, I just went to spend 20000 at the mall. The big lie. 
you know, yeah. over the small truth. That's of kind of the world that we're in. Of course. Have. Of course. Of course, man. This is the deal. What, 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 what's the saying? No. The truth be boring. Truth. Real life be boring. The truth is boring. The truth is boring. Real life is boring. Like, that's why a lot of movies you see, they be based on a true story. Yeah. If they gave you the whole story word for word and play for play the way it went down, it's not going to sell no damn tickets at no movie theater. It has to be entertaining. So with the exception of anything criminal that anybody has done, do you ever exaggerate things in your rhymes, or you rather just keep things solid on any level of exaggeration. I, mean, I got I got two hundred pair of sneakers, but I got fifty seven. Or do you ever exaggerate? I probably wouldn't go. I probably wouldn't go there. But I, I didn't give him true lies that I bring drama like sports and nigga. True lies and white guys. You feel me? Yes, sir. Uh, like 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 you know. I mean, sometimes you gotta put a twist on it. Or it gets boring. Because it's the truth. And real life is boring. 